Okay, when we say gastric reflux, um, the, this means that uh, acid in the stomach actually flows out of the stomach and back up into the esophagus or the gullet. And uh, this can be a distressing event for some people. It's actually normal for the stomach to have a lot of acid inside. That is actually a job of the stomach to produce the acid so that uh, food that goes into the stomach uh, will have any bacteria or germs in the food uh, th th this will then become neutralized by the acid. Most of the time, gastric reflux or acid reflux uh, is used interchangeably. Uh, it is only in very, very rare circumstances that gastric reflux is not acid reflux. Uh, in Singapore, it's much less. We are talking about 10-20% of our people have had some symptoms of uh, acid reflux at some point. So definitely much less compared to the West. Gastric reflux happens when uh, gastric contents, uh, which are acidic, uh, when they flow from the stomach back into the esophagus or the gullet. And this happens when, uh, under a few circumstances, one is when there is a lot of food or a lot of uh, uh, drink inside the stomach. This then increases the pressure inside the stomach and therefore making it easier for uh, things inside the stomach to move backwards into the esophagus. The other uh, circumstance when this would happen will be when the valve between the esophagus and the stomach uh, becomes lax. Um, usually between the stomach and the uh, esophagus, uh, there's a valve known as the lower esophageal sphincter which keeps the two compartments separate. So usually this is closed. Um, however, if this valve becomes lax, then uh, acid or stomach contents will flow more easily from the stomach into the esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter is made up of a few components. Uh, it is made up of the muscles in the lower part of the esophagus here and it's also made up of components of the diaphragm here. The diaphragm is actually the muscle which separates the chest from the abdomen. If either of these components uh, become weak uh, for whatever reason, that is when this um, laxity can happen. And so if the diaphragmatic muscles are weak or if the muscles in the lower part of the esophagus is weak, then you will have a weak low esophageal sphincter. The other time when the low esophageal sphincter will not work very well is when someone has what is known as a hiatus hernia. In a hiatus hernia, this component of the gut actually moves upwards so that a part of the stomach is actually in the chest. So when this whole thing moves upwards, you have disrupted the lower esophageal sphincter because part of the sphincter is now in, in the chest and part of it is now lower down uh, at, around the diaphragm. And so with a disrupted lower esophageal sphincter or weak lower esophageal sphincter, that's when it's also easier for uh, acid to move from the stomach into the uh, esophagus. Actually, as we get bigger and as we become, uh, and as the percentage of people become uh, who are obese increases, uh, being obese is, uh, actually increases your chance of having acid reflux symptoms. Because you can imagine that if you have got, uh, well, more things you know, here, if you've got a very big tummy and you've got more things pressing down on your stomach, then uh, this pressure alone will make it easier, you know, it increases pressure on the stomach, so it's easier for, uh, again, easier for stomach contents, uh, which are acidic, to move from stomach upwards. Common condition that a lot of women will, will experience is pregnancy. So in pregnancy, you get a baby growing inside, and especially when you reach the eighth month and ninth month, you've got a big baby inside pressing on the stomach. Then 
a fair percentage of women will also experience this acid reflux symptoms, which will disappear after they give birth. The classical symptom is heartburn. And when we say heartburn, that means that uh, people actually experience a burning sensation uh, in the chest. Uh, other people don't talk about heartburn, but people, some people will talk about chest pain. Other people will talk about uh, pain in the upper part of the tummy. Uh, others will talk about uh, difficulty in swallowing or painful swallowing. Or others will talk about uh, having a lump uh, in the throat so that uh, there's again some difficulty in swallowing because of this lump in the throat. And others will uh, say that uh, sometimes, especially when they um, wake up suddenly in the middle of the night, they actually feel uh, liquid uh, flowing up into the mouth and this liquid is uh, uh, sour or acidic in taste and this is called acid brash and this is uh, again something that is, uh, can be associated with uh, gastric reflux. Then there are the symptoms that are called the extra esophageal symptoms of uh, acid reflux and uh, these symptoms include things like chronic cough or a chronic sore throat or um, worsening of asthma. You are no longer feeling the symptoms here. You know, things like difficulty swallowing, things like chest discomfort or heartburn, they all happen here where the esophagus is. The extra esophageal symptoms actually happen further up, either in the throat or in the mouth. And this is caused by acid going from the stomach up the esophagus and then finally into the throat and mouth area. And that's why uh, sometimes if someone has got a chronic sore throat, uh, if they go and see an ENT doctor, the ENT doctor will then take a look at the throat and say that, you know, it's quite inflamed down here and it looks like it is acid coming up here and causing this inflammation, therefore causing a sore throat. Acid reflux uh, can be diagnosed in a number of ways. The easiest and the most convenient way is actually for the doctor to take a history from the patient. And if we find that there is a history of symptoms compatible with acid reflux, then we can give the patient a course of uh, medicine to suppress acid. And if after a course of this medicine of a few weeks, the patient actually feels better then this is actually uh, one way that will make a diagnosis of uh, acid reflux. So simply based on symptoms uh, and the response of these symptoms to therapy. The next way is actually to do an endoscopy or gastroscope on the patient. Uh, in this procedure, we'll actually put a uh, tube from the mouth into the stomach and along the way, we will look at the esophagus. And what we are looking for in the esophagus is uh, damage, especially to the lower part of the esophagus, where we may see uh, erosions or ulcers in the lower part uh, due to acid coming up from the stomach into the esophagus. Obviously, in order to see this damage of either erosions or ulcers, it means that the acid reflux must be quite severe. Um, and uh, gastroscopy will not help to diagnose the milder forms of acid reflux. In order to pick up the milder forms of uh, acid reflux, then the patient may need to do um, a, a test known as a pH monitoring test. In this procedure, uh, we actually put a tube through the nose uh, into the esophagus and we'll park this uh, tube in the esophagus for 24 hours. The patient is meant to go uh, through his or her normal everyday activities with this tube for 24 hours. And during this time, uh, we will then monitor whether there's actually any acid coming up from the stomach into the esophagus. Uh, that is actually the most accurate way of, um, of seeing whether there is actually this problem. Because, can you imagine, if you were to do this for 24 hours and if you tell me that you have got symptoms during this time, but during this time we cannot find evidence of acid coming up, 
then you cannot be having acid reflux. Something else must be causing your symptoms. Uh, I agree it's tough and therefore it is something that uh, we don't often use. But in patients who are still having problems despite being on uh, maximal doses of medicine, before we actually go on and say that we want to do surgery, which will be even tougher on the patient, um, uh, I, I would send a patient for this particular test just to confirm that that is truly a problem that might require surgery. We can divide treatment for gas gastric reflux into three main groups. Uh, first group is the um, non non medicine non surgical type of uh, treatment where it's a change in the lifestyle meaning things like uh, don't eat too much uh, don't, don't eat until you are very very full because that means that there's a lot of food in your stomach uh, increases pressure in the stomach and therefore increases the chance of acid reflux um, the other change in lifestyle that we usually advocate is don't eat too close to your bedtime. Uh, give at least two or three hours bet between the time you eat, the end of the meal, and the time you go to bed, so that it gives your stomach some time to digest the food and move the food downwards into the small intestine. Uh, we we'll also usually ask patients to uh, elevate the head of the bed. So instead of sleeping on one pillow, maybe sleep on two pillows, so that uh, your, your head is maybe 10, 20 cm at least above uh, your mattress. Um, then uh, we'll also usually ask patients to stop smoking because smoking is one of those things that may loosen the low esophageal sphincter and therefore making reflux easier. Um, many patients also say that it is uh, useful to them to uh, decrease the amount of uh, caffeine that they take, therefore reduce the amount of coffee and tea. Uh, reduce the amount of spicy food, reduce the amount of fatty foods. Um, so, so all these are uh, relatively simple uh, lifestyle changes that one could make in order to help the symptoms. Then we come to the medical treatment. The usual medicine that we start with is uh, what we call a proton pump inhibitor. Um, and uh, what the proton pump inhibitor does is to uh, reduce the amount of acid produced. This uh, and the common proton pump inhibitors are things like omeprazole, um, onyxium, or uh, Pariot. Um, there are a few others, but uh, I won't go through all of them. Uh, the, there are slightly weaker uh, medicines compared to proton pump inhibitors to, uh, to reduce acid production and uh, they include things like uh, Zantac or Cymatidine. Um, these are the older drugs. They don't work as well as the proton pump inhibitors, but um, for people with mild symptoms, this could be sufficient. There are the even older drugs, which are the antacids. And the antacids um, uh, can be taken either as a tablet or as a liquid. And these, are, and these can be useful as uh, adjuncts to either the proton pump inhibitors or to the um, histamine receptor uh, antagonists like uh, Zantac or Cymatidine. In this day and age, because of the um, effectiveness of the proton pump inhibitors, uh, we seldom need to use uh, surgery, but uh, it is possible um, to, for someone who is not responding to even the maximal doses of uh, proton pump inhibitors to go through surgery to strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter uh, so as to reduce the chance of uh, acid coming from the stomach into the esophagus. Most commonly used group, the proton pump inhibitors, uh, potentially can have side effects when used in the long term. Uh, and when we say using these medicines in the long term, we're not talking about taking it for one month, two months or three months. We're talking about taking this for years and years. And the potential long-term effects, uh, it increases the risk of uh, osteoporosis because it can affect 
uh, calcium absorption. Uh, it increases the risk of um, pneumonia in some patients, especially patients in ICU. Um, it can also affect the absorption of certain vitamins like vitamin B12.